Okay, so that is the model for the yes. Um, and that is also most of the code that I want to show, um, just because as the models get comp more complex, it'll be, it gets more difficult to read that. But um, so one thing we can do, and um, I want to show this plot here. Um, so this is without any modeling, right? It's really just showing the growth rates on the log scale of all these different countries. So here we have Italy, and this is just making the same point again that I made earlier, that if you look at this, right, you definitely see a lot of similarities, like the growth rates seem remarkably consistent for many countries, which is reasonable because it's the same virus everywhere, so why should it spread in other countries differently? Uh, although it does, right? So I think this is Japan, um, which has a much lower growth rate, but a lot of them do have very similar growth rates. So if we now have a country like Italy, right, where we have a lot of data, and maybe a country, um, like for example, the US, where uh, the number of days since 100 cases is much earlier, or other countries where it's just starting, right? So if we were to just take the model that I just showed and fit that separately to each country, those countries with very few data points our predictions would be all over the place because we have only a few data points to really accurately estimate the model. While we actually do know where it's going to head, it, right? So assuming that it's going to be similar to all these other countries where we have more data for is a very reasonable assumption. And we can build it into our model using what is called a hierarchical model. And the way to think about this is that we still have parameters for each individual country so now we don't just model the yes, we model all the countries simultaneously. But we're not just going to say, okay, if there's a growth rate for the yes, there's a growth rate for Germany, but we're going to assume that those growth rates themselves are constrained and follow a group distribution, right? So we're going to assume that there is um, a group level distribution that describes, on average, this is how all countries perform, right? And again, that doesn't mean that we are going to use that average for all the countries, but it's just going to help the model constrain this. So there's, for example, this is Italy, and this is um, a country where we only have very few cases. Well, through this communication, essentially, over this group distribution, what we have learned from all the other countries, we're going to apply to the country where we have very few data points. And that's just going to make the inference and the prediction of the model much better. Um, and these models are extremely powerful and hierarchies exist in many data sets, right, whenever you have nested data. And for me, it's like one of the key um, superpowers of Bayesian statistics because you can do this, you can hardly do this in any other framework. Well, if you just do scikit-learn or something, right, there is no hierarchical model. So whenever you have hierarchies, um, this type of model is very powerful. And again, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just to show that the model now gets more complex, but not by much. So for every parameter that we had before, so we still have our intercept, we still have our slope, but now each of those is three different probability distributions. We have our group mean, we have our group standard deviation, and then we have the individual intercepts for each country. So here we have the shape parameter for the number of countries, and it follows the group mean rather than before we just set it to a particular value, right? So now this is also going to be estimated as well as this. So it's all going to be estimated. The individual intercepts, the group intercept, the average of all the intercepts, and how much spread there is in the intercepts between those. Um, and again, so these are all normal, but because this is the variance, it's just half normal, uh, the standard deviation. The same thing for the slope, and then here I'm just looping through all the countries, and again, creating a different growth rate, uh, or a different growth, so this is the vector of individual data points, coming from my um, exponential distribution. And uh, then I'm just feeding that into likelihood. And that is now everything I need to do to build the hierarchical model. And then I just call sample again uh, without any modification. And then this is what, what comes out. Um, so this is fairly close to the model that I posted on Twitter like two weeks back. And what was really cool is uh, Hamel Hussein reached out to me and was like, oh yeah, I built this cool dashboard thing. Um, wouldn't it be cool to include this here and have it daily updated? So if you go to covid19-dashboards.com, that is the website that he created. And 
uh, by now there's all kinds of contributions from various people about different visualizations. And if you go down to COVID-19 mm -hmm. growth rate prediction, um, this is the notebook that Hamel and I did. Um, and also really cool what he did is, um, so here we can see the posteriors for a certain set of countries. So these are the growth rates. Um, and but the, the main thing that you probably want to look at is the predictions of the model. So this is very similar to the plot that I just showed where in gray we have the predictions um, of the model, but now we're also forecasting the future. So based on how this trajectory unfolded so far, we can assume based on the exponential model, right? So of course, all of this is going to be dependent on the model. Um, and if we just keep projecting that out, this exponential will just keep on growing until billions and billions, right? So obviously that is ridiculous. Um, there will be a, a slowdown, but um, this model does not account for that. So that's just a limitation of the model. Um, um, before you move on, I wanted, I wanted to ask a quick question now. So somebody here has a question I thought was a good one. Um, so with the hierarchical modeling, where you're using the hierarchy to, to pull information across states or countries, um, could you do the same thing to to account for, or could you use that framework to account for uh, different intervention policies in different countries? So if a, a certain groups of countries took a different set of actions with respect, with, in terms of response to the epidemic, and those, then you can somehow kind of categorize them as similar. Could you incorporate that structure into the hierarchy? Yeah, I really like that question. Um, yes, you could. So that is an interesting approach is to say, well, now we assume that they all come from the same group mean distribution, but we could definitely say, well, maybe there are differences in these groups and we could say, okay, let's give a separate group distribution to those countries that had interventions versus those that didn't have interventions and probably we'll find different growth rates among them. Um, another thing is, well, what about, for example, the Asian countries? For some reason, they seem to have way lower growth rates. Um, I guess it's still not clear why. Maybe they have better hygiene or more people are wearing masks. I don't know. But um, that is something that the model, you could also plug into the model because you have some reason to assume that maybe different countries with different protocols in place or different cultural norms uh, respond differently. And uh, yeah, so that is definitely something that you could build in and that would be quite interesting. Um, yeah, and then, uh, so going back to the dashboard, Hamel also built in this really cool interactive visualization where you can also from a drop down menu choose, uh, say, Germany and see what other predictions there. And one thing you can stop seeing especially now so um i don't know when i started this the exponential fit was like really good early on but now for some countries it's definitely starting to break down which of course is excellent news right so we we want this model to break um because it means that our exponential assumption is wrong um yeah so for example japan actually still has um is matched by the model fairly well but you can see so this is the 33 percent daily growth rate the spread is way way slower um, but then you also have countries like South Korea, where the model is just, actually, I see that I need to fix this, but you can see, okay, well, this is definitely not an exponential, right? So here's the log scale, here's the linear scale. So they really managed to completely dampen the number of new cases, and this is where the model breaks down. And you can see, yeah, so uh, it's doing its best to fit this, but um, yeah, this is, yeah, you can see how the model fails and it would project that this, which could, should keep going up. Um, so we know that this model is not perfect, right? So it maybe provides some interesting insights early on, but for certain cases, it's starting to break down. And that is expected because, well, all models have their limitations. But what we can do then, of course, is start to improve the model and see, well, what is the next iteration we can do to try and improve things? And one fairly simple addition is to use a so-called logistic model, which gets around this unreasonable assumption that we just keep having in uninterrupted growth, right? So there will be a, somewhere where this 
stops at the very least at the number of uh, the total world population. And let's hope that that is not the carrying capacity. Um, so it will saturate. And that is what the logistic allows. So actually early on, it matches the exponential fairly well. But then with more time, you see that it's slowing down and slowly narrowing in what is called the carrying capacity. Um, so this is basically the maximum of number of infectious that we will get eventually in the long run. Um, so this uh, model is fairly similar. It's just this different formula. Um, and the model also looks very similar, actually. Um, so I'm not going to show the code, but you can probably think what that looks like. So we have now three parameters. We have the uh, some, we have the intercept, we have the growth, and we also now have the carrying capacity. Um, so we can build that model and then estimate it on data. And here is the fit for South Korea. So now you can see, well, yeah, we do have that exponential growth early on, and then we get this nice smoothing out effect. Um, what was surprising to me a little bit is, well, it seems like even that model doesn't actually capture what's going on because the number of cases are still growing. It's just much slower. So, um, well, now we could, of course, start to think, well, what would be a better model? Well, maybe it's actually not that um, we just are already in this slope thing, but that just the growth rate was severely stunted. So, I mean, these are all plausible ideas and we can just keep working on these models to improve them to best account for the data. Thomas, before you move on to the next model, I um, just want to ask you a few questions from the questions sure. that are adding up here. Um, so one, uh, I thought this was a really cool question. Um, I, this is from Aravind. You can correct me. I'm going to try and parapha paraphrase your question here. But how sensitive is the posterior predictive distribution to the hyperparameters of your priors? And does it is it more sensitive in some of the in 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 some models uh, than in, than in others? Right. So the question, if I understand correctly, is about the influence of the priors and specifically in relation to the hyperpriors. Uh, well, is, yeah, the hyperpriors and the and the hyperparameters of those priors, um, and the sensitivity of the forecasts to to those to those hyperpriors and their parameters. Right. Um, yeah, so that's a very important question. The um, so in and, general, and does, it, does it vary across the model categories that you're applying here? That sensitivity. I see. Uh, interesting. Yeah. So I can't answer that because I haven't tried it. Um, but definitely something like a sensitivity type of analysis for price is a really good idea. I haven't done that here, so I can't like quantitative quantitatively answer that question. Um, so I can just provide general guidelines that um, so two things are true which is one is the more data you have the less the influence of your price so often it is said the price are easily overwhelmed by the data um, and the second thing is that uh, in hierarchical models I would expect um, you would expect that this influence of the hyperparameters is much smaller so in general the further you, you the further you are removed from the um, from the data, the less the influence of that is going to be. And also because now we have way more data to pool, so our estimates will be way more precise. 